Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming out on a cold night. I'm Bill Cavanaugh. I'm the director of the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology uh, here at DePaul. And um, as usual, we have hospitality uh, over there. Feel free to help yourself to food and drink um, during the lecture and during the uh, Q&A uh, period. Um, we're delighted this evening to welcome home to Chicago uh, Bob Maher, who is a native of Rogers Park and is one of the Chicago Irish six uncles were cops. So that's, um, that, that'll give you an idea of how Chicago and how Irish um, Bob is. But he went from here to Notre Dame. Uh, got a, all right, got another domer. Double domer. Double domer, excellent. <laughs> Um, yeah, class of uh, class of '66, um, knew Eric Parsegan when he was there too. So um, some some good football stories to tell. Um, came back to Chicago to the University of Chicago for his PhD, and is now professor of humanities at Hampshire College and a, a world-renowned scholar um, across various areas. But um, has made himself uh, well known in the areas of uh, peace, reconciliation, and especially dealing with the traumas of war, um, and got into these areas um, based on personal experience with people that had suffered uh, the trauma uh, of war. So he's been an advocate for peace, he's been an advocate for veterans, and um, uh, he's been a, a tireless uh, advocate for um, dialogue uh, amongst uh, peacemakers, veterans, and anybody else that's um, dealing with these uh, very difficult issues of uh, war and violence. Um, one of his books is uh, for sale. The most recent book, uh, Killing from the Inside Out, is it the most recent? No. no. There's, an, okay. there's another after that, War and Moral Injury. War and Moral Injury is more recent, okay. Um, but we have uh, uh, one of his books for sale outside, so please take a look. I'm sure Bob would be willing to autograph it uh, for you. For a, um, for a small fee. A small <laughs> fee. <laughs> a smile. So um, uh, anyway, we're we're very uh, pleased and honored to uh, have Bob here with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming Bob Ma. Thank you, Bill, and for that. Wonderful introduction. I'm delighted to be back here in Chicago and to be welcomed by Paul University. I want to open very, very briefly with something that I, uh, with just a word of, of tribute to someone that the world lost today um, and was a very, very close friend of mine. Um, Ruth Scott, her husband, contacted me a few hours ago and she passed away at 60 from a cancer, a long battle with cancer. Ruth was wore more hats than Bartholomew Cubbins of, of uh, Dr. Seuss fame. Ruth was uh, a peacemaker, a working uh, war and reconciliation uh, facilitator. She worked in Rwanda, she worked in South Africa, she worked in Israel-Palestine, and perhaps most notably, uh, in Northern Ireland, and uh, for the last years of her life, she worked in Egypt, uh, working with women who were vic the victims of sexual abuse, sexual ex exploitation, genital mutilation, uh, and she was a great and fierce and loving defender of, of women in various parts of the world, but especially in the last years in, in, in Egypt. And she was a broadcaster, a commentator. She had her own radio show on the BBC. Um, she worked very closely with the Archbishop of Canterbury to try to hold the, uh, the Anglican Church together, facing issues of uh, the, a number of issues that threatened to split the Anglican Church, as, as we know, similar issues are threatening to split the Catholic Church uh, in, in this country and elsewhere. 
but anyone, I think, who argues uh, that women don't belong at the altar, they've never met this God. And uh, so she is the strongest argument I know um, personally for from women priests. And I think we can all live hopefully for that day. I'll begin with my talk and I would ask that they should, they should pray for the family of, of Scott and Philip. And also, um, immediately, practically immediately after her death, the BBC um, you know, released this statement, and it was very brief, and it says, Ruth Scott was a hand to hold for thousands of people in her life. And that particular holding the hand of others is going to come up very, very crucially in what you may think in, in, in my thoughts. So I'd like to begin with those words of tribute to her. We begin with the story of Lazarus and what it might mean. Of the four gospel writers, only John includes this story, which is in itself remarkable. Of all the wonders worked by Jesus in the Gospels, this is the most wondrous and welcome. I say welcome because while only some of us may find ourselves blind or lame, diseased or paralyzed, leprous or possessed by evil spirits, all of us are mortal, and if we are honest with ourselves, confronting our death every day. The miracle of Lazarus walking from his tomb stunned the silence stunned to silence all those who saw it with their own eyes. For anyone else told the story, or like us reading it in a book, it strikes a spark of hope and sustains a flame. What I have to say this evening about the raising of Lazarus is all about hope and resurrection, about returning from death to life, and about the miraculous power of love and friendship and prayer. Unless I have missed something, of all the miraculous healings performed by Jesus, only in this one are we told explicitly that Jesus loved the one he healed, came to him out of friendship, and wept when he learned of his beloved friend's affliction and death. It is rare in the Gospels of here to hear of Jesus weeping. He would weep again entering Jerusalem for the last time, and then on the Mount of Olives, begging his father to spare him, to spare him the agonizing death he was about to undergo. Death and the loss of friends shake our foundations, unweaving the shared web of life that keeps us on our feet, keeps us going, which is why the raising of Lazarus is a story that stops us short and makes us think. My thoughts on it, which I will share now, take what may seem to many an unusual tack. I only hope that, however unexpected, my reading may prove helpful and illuminating. We read in the story of Lazarus. The sisters, you know, the sisters are Martha and Mary, who in, and Mary is the one who anointed Jesus, uh, wiped his feet with her hair and anointed her his feet with oil. The, the sisters sent this message, we read, to Jesus. Lord, the man you love is ill. And then on receiving the message, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. The word here in the original Greek for what afflicts Lazarus is asthenia, the lack or absence of sthenos, or strength, physical or spiritual, vigor or virtue. The sisters were telling Jesus, in short, that Lazarus, their brother and his friend, is failing, or that he is leaving us. So come, they plead. Jesus, we read, displayed his coming for, for two days, assuring those around him that Lazarus's condition was not prosthanaton, was not terminal. It would not end in death. Lazarus, in other words, would come out of it. After two days, Jesus set out to Bethany to be with his exhausted friend, explaining that 
in his words, our friend Lazarus is at rest. I'm going to wake him. In, in the several verses that follow, there is real confusion over the meaning of Jesus' words. Is Lazarus asleep or dead? Resting in life or resting in death? The root of the semantic confusion here is that every word used for, has both meanings, both in the original Greek and in English. The fact is we often reach for euphemisms when we address the hard reality of death. But there is another still deeper source of this confusion. Death and sleep are often hard to tell apart, which is why in Greek mythology, death and sleep, Thanatos and Hypnos, are siblings, in fact, identical twins. Since antiquity, and even today, declaring death is a tricky call, fraught with uncertainty and more guesswork than we care to admit. To resolve the current confusion over the condition of poor Lazarus, we are told that Jesus put it plainly, Lazarus is dead. Lazarus abethanon. But this is only a half-truth, a temporary patch on the problem, for in retrospect, Jesus' first prognosis will prove to be the true one. Lazarus will be wakened and will walk from his tomb from what we might today call a near-death experience. Might it not be accurate to say that Lazarus, before Jesus came to him, was neither simply alive nor simply dead, or to put it differently, he was both alive and dead. We read that when Jesus stood outside the dark cave in which Lazarus lay, he lifted his eyes and prayed in these words, Father, I thank you for hearing my prayer. Then his prayer uttered and heard, Jesus cried, we read, cried in a loud, in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. No laying on of hands, no anointing, no embrace, no touch. Jesus only called out to his friend in a loud voice, in a loud voice Lazarus would recognize. This looks and sounds as if Lazarus was, as Jesus first described him, asleep, awaiting a summons, awaiting liberation. Then when Lazarus emerged on his own feet again, under his own power, Jesus said, unbind him, let him go free. Lazarus is free to return to his life without the disabling asthenia, this weakness, disability, that looked and felt so much like death. In reading and visualizing this story, we witness Jesus performing the spiritual work of mercy that is our focus this evening. In praying for Lazarus, he prayed for the living and the dead, a prayer that was heard, a prayer that called out to a friend and summoned him, challenged him, freed him to rise and re-enter his life. When I hear this story today, after many years of working with veterans of war, those who have waged it and those who have been its victims, I see the faces of men and women who, like Lazarus, are both living and dying, are both alive and dead. They have marched or been marched into the valley of death called war and never found, never quite found a way out, a way back. They are alive but often wish they were not. Many speak of having lost their souls or having lost their humanity or both. They have gone dark in life without having a strong heart in death. Their asthenia is what we, we have come to call moral injury. A new name for an old wound, a deep wound to the soul that is now widely understood by the military and the Veterans Administration to be the principal cause of the despair and hopelessness of too many veterans and active duty servicemen and women. The fact that nearly every hour of every day brings another suicide shocks us. But the shock that statistics inflict is brief. It takes only one face, one story, one life cut short to convey the sorrow of war, the grief, the waste. Then there are those who have neither taken their lives nor embraced them, those who in the words of Euripides Hecabe have out simply outlived the world they knew. 
they, like Lazarus, lie engulfed in what former combatants have described to me as an impenetrable darkness, waiting to be summoned, awakened, unbound, free to live life again in the light. We see moral injury in the mark of Cain, born by the first fratricide, cursed to wander, a fugitive from his own life. We hear it in the pained words of Major, of Marine Major Brian Chantosh, the focus of a documentary entitled Breaking Point, Company of Heroes. Assessing the enemy lives he took, he had this to say. It's a murder, it's, it's murder with a reason, but still, what it comes down to is just straight up murder. Yeah, he went on, whether justified, whether legal, whether for a greater good, whether whatever. I've just done some terrible things to other human beings. Yeah, if there's a hell, I'm going to hell for all the terrible things I've done, but I'm okay with that. We read it over and over in heart-rending notes left behind by honored veterans who have found the burden of life after war too heavy to bear for even one more day. One of these was Daniel Summers, a veteran of Operation Iraqi Freedom. On June 10th, 2013, five years after returning home, Daniel wrote a letter to his wife and then died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to his head. In his heartbreaking last words, Daniel, Daniel explained to his wife that there are some things, he wrote, there are some things that a person simply cannot come back from. How can I possibly go around like everyone else? The first thing to understand about moral injury is that it is a moral injury. That is to say, not a psychological injury, much less a neurological one. Moral injury, as the name suggests, has to do with morality and conscience, responsibility for the lives and deaths and suffering of others, and the consequences of our actions, what we have done, witnessed, been a part of, or failed to prevent. In The Descent of Man, Charles Darwin concluded, I quote, of all the differences between man and the lower animals, the moral sense, or conscience, is by far the most important. In the view of Dr. Michael Tomasello of the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology, in his words, it says, in, it is our morality that defines us as a species. And Harvard psychologist Dr. Steven Pinker claims that, he writes, morality is close to our conception of the meaning of life. Moral goodness is what gives each of us the sense that we are worthy human beings. Put simply, it is our deeply ingrained sense of right and wrong that makes us unique that separates us from every other animal, and this distinctiveness grants each of us our humanity. Martha Nussbaum has spoken eloquently of the fragility of goodness, and perhaps nowhere is goodness, of course, ours and others more fragile than in war, where the human stakes could simply not be higher. Indeed, as Gita Sereni, author of Into That Darkness, has reminded us, our coral moral selves are brittle. Our goodness is vulnerable to injury. And in, in her words, if morality is extinguished, there is no human being left. Is there no such thing, we might wonder and ask, of a, as a moral war? In its just war doctrine, the Roman Catholic Church has for 15 centuries argued that there are two kinds of killing, two kinds of war, one that God abhors, and another that is acceptable, and even at times pleasing, to the God of love. While the Orthodox Church, on the other hand, has never accepted that argument. As I see it, the just war theory is and has always been a deception, a betrayal of the life and words of Jesus, poisoning the roots of Christianity. I have often tried to make that case, and this is not the occasion for me to try again. Instead, I will share with you the words of my good friend, Army Major Sean Levine, a decorated combat veteran and also an Orthodox priest and Orthodox Army chaplain. These are his words. 
From the Orthodox Christian perspective, war can only be evil. I always approach veterans as those who have broken themselves on the anvil of this nation's defense, often for causes way beneath the dignity of the sacrifice warriors are willing to make. They are tainted with death, and you should see the relief that comes to them when they find a place to share the burden of their sin. I don't have to tell them that they have transgressed. They know it, and it brings peace to the soul just to hear someone accept it. J. Glenn Gray, a World War II veteran who saw action in North Africa, Italy, France, and Germany, puts it this way. A walk across any battlefield shortly after the guns have fallen silent is convincing enough. A sensitive person is sure to be oppressed by a spirit of evil there, a radical evil, which suddenly makes the medieval images of hell and the thousand devils of that imagination believable. Reverend Bill Mahady, a legend among so many veterans, served as a Catholic chaplain in Vietnam. After he returned from war and until his death just five or six years ago, he gave his life to his fellow veterans, helping them come home on the longest, most arduous journey of their lives. The oldest among these, among those he helped, had served in the Spanish-American War, and the youngest were those returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. Looking back on his service as a chaplain in Vietnam, he had these words to say. I believe the essential failure of the chaplaincy in Vietnam was its inability to name the reality for what it was. We should first have called it sin, admitted we were in a morally ambiguous and religiously tenuous situation, and then gone out to deal with the harsh reality of a soldier's life. In theological terms, war is simply sin. This has nothing to do with whether a particular war is justified or whether isolated incidents in a soldier's war were right or wrong. The point is that war as a human enterprise is a matter of sin. It is a form of hatred for one's fellow human beings. It produces alienation from others and nihilism, and it ultimately represents a turning away from God. The language of sin and the soul, and the soul it wounds or kills, strikes many of us today as dated, a form of magical thinking, quaint. The very word sin, wrote psychiatrist Carl Menninger in 1973, the very word sin, which seems to have disappeared, was a proud word, he wrote. It was once a strong and an ominous, and it was a serious word. It described a central point in every civilized human being's life plan and lifestyle. But the word went away. It has almost disappeared. The word, and he wrote this in 1973. The word along with the notion, why doesn't anyone ever sin anymore? When it comes to war and its hidden wounds, however, the language of sin and of losing one's soul suddenly makes sense again to many veterans and victims of war. One veteran I know put it this way, I never even believed I had a soul until I lost it. Until it was trivialized for the sake of a paternalistic, mean-spirited obsession with church discipline, holding eternal damnation over the heads of those who ate meat on Friday or missed Mass on Sunday, mortal sin meant a transgression so profound that it had threatened, that it threatened the very life of the soul, shattering the image of God in us. The spiritual state of sin, like the physical malaise or asthenia of Lazarus, has all the aspects of death, and unless called out of that impenetrable darkness, it is death, soul death. Once summoned, the journey, the Camino of Lazarus, was short and all but instantaneous. Once he was summoned, once he was wakened, it was a matter of a few steps from entombed darkness to the light of day. For those darkened by war, however, the return from the killing fields, Jungian analyst James Hillman assures us, 
The return from the killing fields is a slow, arduous ascent from hell. D. William Alexander, whom I will call David, has chronicled in heartfelt detail one such ascent from hell. David, a former Marine paratrooper, is an Orthodox priest, <coughs> chaplain, and trauma therapist who in over 75 sessions worked with, work, work with a veteran, a deeply wounded and tormented Vietnam veteran who we will call Gregory. David describes him as follows. He describes his first impression of Gregory. I will likely never be able to forget that elusive and ethereal quality of his presence when he entered the room. His long hair and beard was in disarray. His clothing hung loosely from an emaciated frame. His hands were tense and clawed, and his eyes hung under arched eyebrows as if he were perpetually surprised. His eyes were the same, at the same time intense and hollow. At first he simply stood in the doorway as if he had seen a ghost, or rather as if he had long been seeing ghosts. He stood as if a third of him had remained in the parking lot, a third wished to come and sit inside, and another third was somewhere, somewhere quite else somewhere quite far away. Now, David met with Gregory, or we will possibly call him Lazarus, almost weekly for over two years, in which he endeavored, in the face of many attacks, verbal and physical, to offer himself to Gregory, waiting for Gregory to respond to what David described as the call of loving friendship that makes the bearing of responsibility for one's part in pain more possible. And for the hell of war. Those features of combat-related distress experienced by Gregory included a conscious loss or disconnection from emotion, from inner vitality, and bodily sensation while retaining memory of what it was once like to have to feel alive and embodied, and self-horror after the perceived absorption of evil present in the battlefield, usually accelerated by the veteran's actions. Now we, we might ask, what were, in this case, the veteran, this veteran's actions? In Gregory's case, it was a single action, as David explains. After he had killed another person in combat, he had, according to his own conscience, engaged in fratricide because of the humanity of the enemy. More than this, or perhaps intrinsically linked to this, his act of fratricide had been for him one of existential suicide. After killing another human person, he had not been able, in his own words, to feel any damn thing at all for God or for anyone else. Gregory lived, as David explains, David lived with the constant sense that there was a personal form of evil within him, which he had absorbed either during or either during or very soon after killing another human being. He felt that he had coupled with something evil during his service and described his connection with this evil as a sort of dark marriage that took place when he pulled the trigger of his weapon all those many decades ago. At times he spoke about his singular act of killing in the war as the moment when he lost God. And this um, is Gregory, these are Gregory's words. As if I had lost hold of the hand I had been holding all my life. And then I kept feeling around for it without ever being able to find it again. I want to stay with those words for a moment. As if I lost hold of the hand I'd been holding all my life and kept feeling around without finding it again. I know of no more precise or heartbreaking description of moral injury, mortal sin, or soul death than this. In response, when David offered to Gregory, all that David offered to Gregory was simply his own hand in loving friendship and compassion. The power of another's hand to lessen pain and make connection 
something everyone already knows, has been scientifically confirmed in a recent study conducted at the University of Colorado and the University of Haifa. Reach out the hand for the hand of a loved one in pain, the study concludes, and not only will your breathing and heart rate synchronize with theirs, your brain wave patterns will couple too. The more empathy a comforting partner feels for a partner in pain, the more these brain waves fall into sync, and, in, and increased brain synchronization is associated with less pain. Gregory, like Lazarus, rose and returned to life, summoned by and taking the extended hand of a friend who loved him. It is a grave mistake for professional caregivers to speak over the voices of veterans as they tell their stories and describe their pain, converting one language into another, medicalizing soul injury, reducing spiritual torment to brain chemistry, prescribing drugs instead of listening. It would seem terrifyingly simplistic, writes David, it would seem terrifyingly simplistic to say that love is the answer in aiding veterans like Gregory toward healing, who have experienced a connection with or absorption of evil in combat that has contributed to such personal and relational devastation in the aftermath. And yet that love is the answer, he writes, love is the answer. Yet that love is the answer is my very suggestion. On our last day together, David writes, I remember Gregory walking into my office with a warm smile and sitting down as if he owned the place. As he left the door and walked out to the parking lot, I thought to myself and my notes read, I am leaving Gregory not as a client, but as a friend. With the eyes of faith, we see the raising of Lazarus as a miracle. But with perfectly ordinary eyes, can't we also see something miraculous in the raising of Gregory? Love and its healing power always come as a miracle, as amazing grace to the lost and the suffering. Ubi caritas et amor, et amor deus ibias. Words chanted during the washing of the feet in the liturgy of the Last Supper. Where there is charity and love, there is God. You don't have to be a Christian or, or believe in God, however, to know the power of friendship and love. In what is, in my view, the most transcendent account of healing friendship in the ancient world, the tragedy of Heracles gone mad by Euripides, Heracles returning home from his legendary labors, labors summed up in that play as all the killing you have been doing collapses to the ground, unable to rise or resume his life. He's suffering from asthenia. Disfigured and broken in his pollution and guilt, shrouding himself from the light and recoiling from his friend's extended hand, Heracles wants only to die, and left alone, he will see to that himself. His friend, Theseus, however, assures him that between friends there is no such thing as pollution. He lifts Heracles to his feet, takes on his weight, all his weight, and walks him into the future, while Heracles has this to say about the miracle of a friend's love. Any man who would prefer great wealth or power to love, the love of friends, is sick to the core of his soul. So what can we say finally about praying for the living and the dead? or more specifically, for the living and dead, the living and dead veterans and victims of war. The prayer I suggest is silence, compassionate, loving, silence, generous and non-judgmental. Silent listening with heart and hand extended. Love cures people, writes Carl Manager, both the one who gives it and the one who receives it. When we send men and women off to fight our wars, it is for us, the nation and people who send them there, to bring them back, whole, intact, to the full life they left behind. Not just to welcome them back, but to listen to what they have seen, done, and suffered in our name. To try to understand, to try to understand, and when we fail, to try again, and again. 
You can tell a true war story, writes Tim O'Brien. You can tell a true war story by the way it never seems to end. So we need to be prepared to listen long and hard, as long and hard as it takes. And there's more, as Major Shane, uh, Sean Levine warns us. We need to stop telling our warriors they have nothing to be ashamed of and start listening to their shame, their guilt, their loss, their inner emptiness. We do not listen to such tales because they threaten our illusions and assault our easy-won comfort. But we should listen, and in listening, we should help carry, own, share, and grieve, rather than simply deny their burdens of war. But what good can listening do? Are we really doing anything at all when all we are doing is opening our ears and our hearts in silence to the agony of others? Framed more broadly, we may wonder how the spiritual works of mercy measure up to their corporal counterparts. How can bearing wrongs, forgiving offenses, and praying for others ever be compared with feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, or sheltering the homeless? Here I will turn to Nobel Laureate, Peace Laureate, Lima Bowie, for a response. She led the women of Liberia in resisting and bringing to an end the civil war in Liberia. And by any measure, she is an activist, still is. In the aftermath of the war, she was consumed with the work of recovery and of healing trauma when one day she saw that, in her words, the regular agenda wasn't working anymore. It wasn't working at all. The women kept interrupting insisting on telling their personal stories. I realized that it would be impossible, she writes, I would, it would be impossible to continue without first addressing what these women wanted and needed to say. So about 40 women gathered that night, that very night, to tell their stories. One at a time, in the dark, the speaker would hold a single candle to illumine her face and share what in other words, she wanted and needed to say. After what had been an exhausting day of activism, of corporal works of mercy, the women talked until 3 a.m. From that night on, after dark storytelling became an integral part of working for peace and healing from war. Of one such gathering, Lima writes this, I traveled to an internally displaced persons camp where in a little outside shelter, 50 women gathered to share their experiences during the war. Listening to women unburden themselves of pain was always hard. But this day, there were so many stories of violence and shame and grief, so many sobs and wails, that I reached a point where I didn't think any of us could take it anymore. We can just stop, I said. It's okay. A very old woman rose up on her walking stick. Don't let us stop, she shouted. She said, the UN brings us food and shelter and clothes, but what you've brought is much more important, much more valuable. You've come to hear the stories from our bellies, stories that no one else asks about. Please, don't stop. Don't stop. Don't let us stop. Without taking sides, we see that the spiritual and corporal works of mercy are both essential. Doing nothing, nothing but listening, is doing, I would suggest, possibly more than we might imagine. The story of Lazarus, we recall, contains several pairings, several sets of siblings, death and sleep, Martha and Mary, Jesus and Lazarus. Sleep came, claims us daily but death claims us all in the end. And Martha attends to the demands. Death claims us in the end. Martha attends to the demands of the moment, worrying about and fretting over many things, while Mary does nothing as Martha sees to it. Martha does everything. Mary does nothing. All Mary does is sit and listen. And so, in the words of Jesus, she has chosen the better part. Lastly, we see that Lazarus and Jesus are paired. They are friends, and as Plato suggests, friends have all things in common. 
We see in the death and resurrection of Lazarus the imminent death and resurrection of Jesus, his friend. And if we look hard, we see our own death and resurrection. Friends have all things in common. Our stories converge and echo each other, and we, will, and we must never stop telling them. For veterans, stories are a matter of life and death, sacred stuff, the road out of darkness, the path to healing. All those stories, writes Tim O'Brien in The Things They Carry, all those stories, not bloody stories necessarily, happy stories too, and even a few peace stories. That's what stories are for, he writes. Stories are for joining the past to the future. Stories are for those late hours in the night when you can't remember how you got from where you were to where you are now. Stories are for eternity, when memory is erased, when there is nothing to remember except the story. In, on that theme, I want to play a brief video that some of my students made for a project that I was involved with for years. Um, of Beyond Walls. It's the work of Wilhelm Verwirt. Um, he's the director of it. He was the grandson of um, Henri Verwirt, who was the architect of apartheid, the prime minister, the assassinated prime minister of South Africa, who put Nelson Mandela in prison, and so many others. Responsible. He was was the person, the face, and the architect of apartheid. Wilhelm took another path and worked with um, the Peace and Reconciliation Commission. He wrote his autobiography, um, uh, which was um, for which Nelson Mandela wrote the foreword. I mean, he's worked all his life for peace and reconciliation in post-conflict areas. And this project is to us all about storytelling. It's for um, militaries. Uh, paramilitaries, all those involved in violence, all those who inflict violence, all those who have suffered from it, to come together uh, in, in former conflict areas, uh, North Africa, I mean uh, Northern Ireland rather, South Africa, Rwanda, Israel, Palestine, and, and also uh, I brought him here with this group to, you know, to work with U.S. veterans. And so this is is about the power of storytelling and the, and the anti-dehumanization that is involved in conflict, seeing once again the humanity of the other and embracing them across the, the widest gulf perhaps that we can imagine, those who have who've killed our own children and, um, or inflicted violence, those we feared. And, now we strive to love. So just to show this brief video, which I think is, is um, says better than anything I've said about the road to recovery and healing. It's more easier to live with the notion that the people involved in violence were in some way monsters. I think what's more difficult is that we're not. I'm a former uh, combatant in the Northern Ireland conflict. I became involved actively at the age of 14. I went to prison when I was 17 and was released when I was 30. I became involved in the conflict as a child. The whole area where I lived was militarised. My home was raided many times by the British. My brothers were interned by the British. I'm from South Africa. I come from a time when the apartheid system in South Africa was deeply alive. And I was very much part of that system of, of deep racial segregation and dehumanization. The first introduction I ever had with my grandfather was in prison. He was involved in the political conflict in Northern Ireland. He was one of the people that began an illegal paramilitary organization called the Ulster Volunteer Force. That's the uniform I wore, you know what I mean? The balaclava, the guns. That's what I was involved in. If you don't bring people in communication, in dialogue, in, in some kind of human connection, you're not going to break down these walls. We're going to work with people in different conflict zones, people who've been involved and affected by deep, violent conflict.
when you're in, in the field of conflict transformation, um, I think there, there's an expectation that you've got it all worked out and your life is perfect. We are not here talking about we've arrived, you know, or that we've figured out how to do this. We are very much in the middle of, in different ways, struggling with this. You need people who, who don't necessarily have all the answers, but to have a commitment to, with other people, try and find ways of dealing with complexities. But we're all on that journey. This project really is uh, rooted in my own experience of, of the apartheid system in South Africa and trying to find ways to bring people together who have been deeply divided by violent conflict. It's, it's just really special to welcome you into this space. But there are in fact very few spaces where South Africans from different backgrounds can be really honest with each other. I am a grandson of H.F. Verwoerd. Our policy is one which is called by an Afrikaans word apartheid. It could just as easily and perhaps much better be described as a policy of good neighborliness, accepting that there are differences between people. My family and my community and my church and my grandfather, everybody was very much a part of that, that apartheid system that you've experienced. When I was young, we didn't. I didn't know really what you, what you were going through. I, I grew up under apartheid when I was a teenager. In the violence and the conflict, I saw a lot of horrible things you know, as, a, as a young boy. People get bent by tires, and you're getting shot and killed by police. Every aspect of your life was determined by the color of your skin. And I got involved simply because I was angry. I can literally just look across. And just on the other side of these shacks, you start to see White Stellenbosch or the neighborhoods where I used to grow up. And people just wouldn't, even today, you would find very few people from the white community coming into Kaimandi. If the idea is we want to create a relationship with you, then you open the door. Otherwise, you will remain a monster for the rest of your life. If you, you are left with the guilt, that's what happens. I think for me, the, the fact that Valellum is, is part of this kind of work, for me it means a lot. I mean, for him personally, that his grandfather was a leader of, of the apartheid system. And, and, then, and that, you know, he made a different choice in his life to, to be part and parcel of shaping something different. I lost my 14 years old daughter in a suicide bombing in September 97. And ever since then I started a journey of uh, finding the reason for this senseless killing. I spent seven years in the Israeli jails when I was 17 years old. In jail I came to discover my enemy, the other side, the suffering of the other side. In 2007 I lost my 10 years old daughter to an Israeli border police. When I was serving in the occupation as, as an officer, here I am, a good father, a compassionate father, a responsible father to my children, and I'm totally blocked and shattered to other children. On one hand, you are fulfilling your duties as a father. and the other character, the other role, you are an officer who is not allowed to allow children to pass to a hospital and so on. This situation is really, uh, was transformative for me. When I listened to Rami's story, how he lost his daughter, a suicide bombing in, in Israel. So after that, we don't need words. We just look at each other. We understand. We know the suffering. The ability to listen to the pain of the other. Just listen. Listen. Understand the origins of the fear. It will not be an easy journey. Forgiveness, it's kind of revenge. And this has happened when I met the soldier in the court. I told him that I need you to know that you are not a hero. You are just a killer. You just kill innocent girl. It's not the enemy or the terrorist. I don't want revenge because I don't take revenge from victims. And he's really a victim. When I went into prison, 
I had completely demonized the enemy, felt a sense of superiority over the enemy and that they were less human than I was. And part of my journey in prison was beginning to think about the suffering of the enemy and I felt a sense of betrayal that I was even considering the suffering of the enemy. Working through that and still working through that today, coming to a place that was confronting me with that suffering and a rehumanization not only of myself, who had been desensitized and dehumanized by the violence, but a rehumanization of those that I seen as the enemy. My name's Gerard uh, Foster from Belfast, um, former Republican Socialist prisoner, along to an organization, the ILA, which is the Irish National Liberation Army. We were the worst of the worst, you know, and, and that's would certainly be perceived in, by the Loyalist Unionist Protestant community, you know. Coming from the Loyalist and Unionist community, you can't deny that there was hatred there. Hatred was fed for whatever reason. How do you make sure that hatred doesn't get passed on to the next generation? Because we, did, we weren't born and didn't grow up with hatred in, in our blood. It's something that was passed to us or the circumstances that we found ourselves in. The awakening of me of the hurt and pain that conflict, any conflict causes, is irrelevant to what's said, it, it is the same. And in recognising that hurt and pain, for me, was, was a massive change in my life. And I'm trying to use myself as an example to show that it doesn't actually impact your life in such a way that it changes you totally as a person, but can help, help you deal with inter, internal turmoil, maybe. So part of what I'm wondering is part of that group that you want to help to heal is also part of your own healing that you need healed as well? I will admit there's difficulties. I will admit of issues about the past and not just the suffering that I inflicted, but also I did suffer as well. I mean, you've said it, some people say, do you see yourself as a victim of the conflict? And the answer is no, but I did suffer because of the conflict. In places where there's been conflict, there's definitely a need for, for people to, to have sacred spaces to confront their own demons, where they can be able to cough out the poisonous feelings that uh, they have inside. I mean, that old UVF guy is still in me, still inside me, you know what I mean? I've chosen to go a different way, but I, I know as a human being that I still have the capacity. Because I think it, in much of this work, it's about you inevitably will see human beings at their very best and you'll also hear about the very worst things that human beings have been involved in and, and done. I think there's something there too about when it comes to that description of humanity, it's about the honesty around all of who we are, really all of who we are and most of the time that we live in the world and exist, it's about trying to always present the, the versions of ourselves that are the warmest, are the kindest, are the most beautiful, are the clearest. And I actually think that part of the journey in this work is about sitting with another human being and understanding some of the darkness that they possess and recognising some of your own in that as well. And still saying, I still value who you are while I sit with some of the darkness. I can also see the light. I can also see the good, the imperfections, but the good. And I'm able to hold both of those things t together. And maybe that's what it is to truly value a person, to really be able to sit with all that they are and say, I still would prefer your company. Maybe it's all we can really ask of, a, of, a, of even another human being, whether that's in a, a workshop setting or in a personal capacity. Maybe that's real. Maybe that's really what love is. Um, on the ground at the um, 
in the worst part of the troubles. And, and um, he he's the only British officer who has come back and given his life to reconciliation in Northern, in Northern Ireland. Um, the only British officer who served there and has done that. And Jerry Foster, who is, is this uh, the INLA terrorist who is one of the child soldiers um, and was a bomber and an assassin. Um, and when I first met him, um, he said, you know, if we, if we ever caught a British soldier, he said, we, we would teach that soldier how long it could take to die. Um, and all I saw when those words were spoken was, was a monster. Um, Jerry is very far from, from a monster, and he's come a long, long way. But this British officer, who was his ult, ult, you know, ultra enemy, um, and um, whom, and whom he would have taught how long it could take to die. Over the years of this kind of work, the two have, of them have become so close that when uh, when this um, British officer who had, had had since become a priest. When he got married, he asked Jerry to be his best man. They are now best of friends and very close. Um, the kind of close that leads to asking someone to be your best man. You know, so it's, it's, it's the, the leaps that people have taken in this, in, in this work in all the various post-conflict zones are, are really inspiring. And they show what can be done if you just, as Louise, there at the end, um, said if you just sit with someone in their pain, accept their darkness and the darkness in yourself, and say, I want to be here with you and I honor you. Yes? I'm, I'm wondering what effect it has on the listener to hear what the veterans have to say. I mean, is there, we talked last night about the horses that were used and that the horses themselves had to be, um, <laughs> that the horses that are used in right. therapy have absorbed some of the effects of the stories. I'm wondering if that's also true for human beings who are asking questions or listening to these stories. It's a really, a really good question. Um, if you work a lot with veterans, you have to be very careful of secondary trauma. I, I, a close friend of mine is Jonathan Shea, and we've you know, been very close friends for like 25 years, and so he has always cautioned this, and cautioned me and others, you know, take care of yourself, because you, if you, so, there's that thing that, 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 that you take on when you listen, and listen with your heart, listen openly, and, and help lift someone else you are weighted down. You bear, you know, if you bear someone else's weight, any care for you, any kind of closeness that, that, that friendship. And David Alexander, the, the therapist that I um, met, he was his story with Gregory. He he deals with and he addresses trauma in not only for more but a different areas of disaster in different parts of the world. So he, you know, he, he's, he is burdened. So I think there's, there's always that. And, and, um, but that's the price we have, we should be paying. And the burden of violence and confronting violence, and even, I mean, I'm convinced war is not the answer, but, but nevertheless, um, the we send our men and women off to war, and um, 
is not the work of one half of one percent of the population to bear that full that full weight. I mean, if we send them there, we have to be here to you know to take on Jesus wept you know at 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 the pain of that his friend has him and the death of his friend who's suffering. So I think that there's that. Um, but there's just there's in Vietnam, I mean, in post-Vietnam, there was this this slogan: "If you didn't go, you 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 don't know." In fact, if you didn't know, if you didn't go, you can't know. And no one who has who hasn't been to war can really understand it. But we have to try um, because healing to, for veterans very often depends on telling their stories, um, on sharing what. Their, their stories, um, because that's sharing themselves. Um, and so, if we were really dependent on, on having ex on personal experience to understand anything we wanted to understand, we would be so limited. We, we, we are given imaginations for something. And, um, and so we can, with enough effort, bridge with our imaginations the sufferings and, and pains of others. Uh, because otherwise it's, it, it's just a writing it off, you know, that, that I'll never understand what you, what you went through, so I don't want to hear about it. And, and so it takes courage for veterans to, to, to tell their stories to, to others because they're, they're afraid others will fall asleep, will walk away, will say, I don't want to hear anything. Any more of this? I remember Jonathan Shea told me when, uh, when he worked for years in Boston with severe post-traumatic stress, as it was known then, now he's more of a moral injury. Um, uh, veterans. He finally, since most of them, a great many of them, were Italian and Irish Catholics, with those who, for whom nothing else had worked, sort of helped. Um, he, he said, well, you do as Catholics you know, have such a thing as confession. Um, have you tried that? You know, have you gone tried to seek absolution? And he said that one after the other, many of them came back with one of two stories. The first was that um, they would walk into the confession, begin to talk about what was tormenting them, and the priest would say, I don't need to hear any more from you because you haven't committed any sin. Um, you served your country, served your country with self-sacrifice and bravery. Um, you, you fought in a war that your nation sent you off to, a war that the church approved and the, and, and the nation applauded. And so I can't give you absolution because there is no sin. There's no sin. So go in peace. Um, the other story was after about two or three minutes into into the telling of story and the pain, the priest would say, I'm sorry, I can't listen to any more of this. Um, God may be able to forgive you, but I can't. And so I just, please leave the, leave, you know, get out of here. I don't want to, I can't hear any more of this. Um, now both of those are, are, are failures, um, clearly clearly failures. Another, in my, the unit my brother served with in, in Vietnam, there was a priest, he was helicoptered in, they were on, in the bush. The priest came down in a helicopter and set up a, um, a confessional. Uh, all that meant was he, he, he positioned himself just at the base of the tree, put on his purple skull, these servicemen lined up because he was going to say mass, but he was going to hear confessions first. They lined up you know, a good 15 or 20 feet away from the person who would be confessing. And then um, uh, the first person to kneel in front of the priest and begin to, to speak, after 30, 40 seconds, the priest, in a very audible voice, said, You did what? And at that point, the, um, the line dissolved. Um, 
everyone sort of walked away, and, and that was the, the end of the story. So I, I think it takes so much compassion, understanding, um, and what David says, simply love. Uh, and that, you pay a price, everyone pays a price for that. Um, so I don't know if that answers Lori in any way. Um, yeah. never, we'll never pay the price that these veterans pay. But we have to make the effort. But it can be missing for hours, for days, for years. One more story. I, 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 I know this woman who, whose husband went to Vietnam, came back. He was a completely different man. Uh, they had two children. He came back and, and she just wanted to help him. She wanted to know what he had gone through. Wanted to, he, he never spoke a word about what he had experienced. And uh, after a long while, she sort of begged him, just give me some sense of what you're suffering, what has happened, what, what happened there, what changed you, what are you enduring? And he couldn't, he couldn't speak. But, um, and he always slept, from the moment he came back, from the night he came back, he slept in the living room on the couch. Uh, she was up in their bedroom, the children were in their rooms. And um, one night, a month or two after he was home, she, she woke up and she heard someone talking downstairs, and it was her husband. And, but he was asleep, he was talking in his sleep and telling stories, going through what he was... And she snuck down and crouched behind the couch for hours listening to listen to him. And then she began to tell the, the children who were also just wanting to know, know what had changed him and what he was going through, they would go down, the three of them, the mother and the two children, would go down and when he would start speaking, she would go into, into their room to bring them down, they would listen. And it was helpful to them. Um, it was also perhaps a kind of betrayal. I mean, she, she, she wondered about that because he didn't know she was listening. And then after a year or two, whenever he, when they came down in the morning, the morning, morning of which he had not spoken the night before, in his sleep, uh, he was gone. And that was years ago. They have no idea where he is. He doesn't have no. He's just he's gone. But it was some consolation to them to have heard him tell them something about them, about the suffering. I think it's better to know that not all of us certainly our duty to try to understand. Bob, uh, this doubling back to your brother's story about the confessions. Yes. And, uh, uh, three years ago, a part-time my own student and Iraq, Afghanistan veteran never tell which mm -hmm. uh, Joe Hughes uh, committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And there was a, uh, a mass for him uh, in Chicago. And the priest, I, I don't think, knew Joe at all. Um, and so he gave, he gave a homily. The homily was something that he had given before. And I know that when Lori and I were sitting through it, or at least this, I'll speak for myself, I just became angrier and angrier because it, I didn't know Joe that well, but there were young people in the audience, yes, 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 yes. In, in the congregation, who did. Um, uh, and uh, after the Mass, there was this the traditional the, the playing of taps, mm -hmm. the folding of the flag, Vietnam veterans on the uh, motorcycles, um, mm -hmm. and um, I would have to say that we felt more moved by the few minutes after mass yes, yes, than yes. we felt at all during during it. Uh, and uh, to continue the story and then ask you what you uh, for your comment, I was reluctant to go up to Joe's mother. Know her, uh, uh, but Lori said to you, she needs to know that somebody knew Joe, mm -hmm. and uh, could just say something to her. And, uh, that
that was good advice because the mother was entirely, entirely gracious. I suppose if there's a question I have, it's because some priests seem to be figuring into this conversation. What's a priest to do uh, on such an occasion when he doesn't know the person? How can he speak in such a way to connect with the people who are really close to that unfortunate person? I also think Bob, part of the part part of the problem with this is that we all feel there's this tension in this country about you if you honor the soldier. You have to honor the war, too. That you can't say anything that indicates that there's anything questionable about go being in war without, according to the myth, denigrating the soldier. And so I, I felt horrible for the priest because I felt like he, what was he to say? You know, what could he say not knowing how the, so often the, I think the families are, com we imagine they are comforted by us saying that his sacrifice was honorable and worthy and so forth. And there's this tension between the what the individual has experienced and what we've required of them and how we want to honor that. So I think that's also part of it. Well, I, I think um, what I would say is the priest should have said nothing. That it doesn't mean, mean that nothing should have been said. But there were veterans there, right? I mean, they... Um, as far as we knew, yeah. Yes, yeah, there let, were let outside. Them speak. Sure. I mean, let them be the ones to speak. No, that there were the, the guys in the dress blues, the Marine, he was a Marine. So. Yeah. Um, we need to listen and not, not speak. And the church, in its magisterium, feels it's always obligated and entitled to speak. And if I said anything to that, I think that silence is, is the, the right thing. And, um, and at a, a soldier's or Marine's death, um, I mean, nothing should be said that would call into question, it seems to me, their service or their war. Um, and um, honoring them is entering their grief, entering their pain, entering what led them to their death. And, um, but I would be a hypocrite if I didn't. Um, I just met General Mukiyama, and if I were would you like to say something? Because um, you work in fields of moral injury yourself, and General Uyama is a, war, is a, is a Vietnam veteran, and um, it seems to me that that, uh, that I need to listen to, and that's, uh, I, I never sort of try to say anything without like, well, saying a whole lot. Thank you for, uh, yeah. for asking me to yeah. say something. Um, uh, I am a Vietnam veteran, a uh, combat veteran. I was an infantry officer, uh, 24 years old, leading 200 soldiers uh, in combat. I've had my own moral injury issues, uh, and but I've always had, I've always been a very strong man of faith. Uh, I am a Christian, uh, and. When I had my moral injury, I was able to address it on the spot, which is highly unusual. In fact, one in a million, I would say. Uh, and I was able to, I actually prayed for my enemy on the battlefield. Uh, three dead bodies at my feet. and. I recognized that my heart had hardened, that something had happened to me, that only moments earlier these were alive human beings with families and friends and loved ones. 
and I was really treating them, I wasn't really even treating them at all with respect. And so I prayed. And I remember Jesus' Sermon on the Mount when he told us to pray for our enemies. Uh, but I knew I was praying for myself as much as they. And years later, I realized only after I'd gotten into uh, involved with my ministry, I have a military ministry called Military Outreach USA. So people can go to our website, which is militaryoutreachusa.org. We have a book that we publish, which is called They Don't Receive Purple Hearts, which is, a, I gave a copy to uh, Bob this evening. But it's on our website, you can download it, we don't charge, it's free. And it's, a, it's a really an excellent primer on moral injury. Uh, it talks about what it is. It talks about uh, symptoms. It talks about uh, healing, especially when it comes to uh, faith. And so I would, it talks about history. Moral injury is nothing new. Uh, this is something, go to the Bible, Book of Numbers, chapter 31, uh, when uh, the... Jewish warriors came back from defeating the Midianites. Moses greets them from outside of the camp, but he won't let them re-enter the camp until they go through a purification process. The knights, when they returned from the Crusades, were not permitted to participate in the Holy Sacraments until they went through penance and reconciliation. Native American Indians have had sweat lodges and cultural ceremonies uh, so society is known for millennia. If you send people out to war and they've got to do bad things, when they come back, you got to help them. We've forgotten all of that. And that's why we need to talk about this. People need to share this. As, as Bob said, the best thing is to listen. Uh, but the funeral example, uh, I would have gone up uh, and I would have just said, I am so sorry. And I'm here if you need anything. And that's it. I wouldn't have said anything about, you know, the soldier or his unit or was the war right or whatever. So I hope that helps. Thank you very much. anxious to ask you one question, um, just to talk about this category of moral injury, because it's a really interesting category. Morality is something you do, injury is something that's done to you, and it's a category that kind of combines those two things. Um, and uh, it's something, you're saying something much more than PTSD, which tends to sound like something that's happened to soldiers, but moral injury puts it in that kind of murky position kind of in between something that they've done um, and something that has been done to them. And I wonder if you can talk about this uh, category and why it's necessary uh, rather than just talking about morality on the one hand or just talking about injury like PTSD on the other hand. Well, PTSD is, is really an entirely different type of, of wound or of trauma. And it's the primary emotional component of, of, um, of PTSD is, is fear and loss. And the National Center for PTSD has, it defines it as having three primary triggers, as it were, three primary kinds of trauma. The constant imminent presence of death and fear of death. Um, the loss of a close um, of a close friend and um, and the witnessing of um, actually I'm trying to remember but I think I folded two of those if you want but it's basically the uh, fear and loss moral injury has the primary emotional components of that are shame and guilt that shame and guilt 
Uh, I remember years ago, I was a psychiatrist in, at the University of Michigan. I was asked by the VA to put together a team of, of therapists to work to augment the, the, the psychological component of whatever the counselors at the VA in Ann Arbor. And he wrote me and said, you know, I was prepared to do this because I'm trained in trauma therapy. He said, but nothing prepared me uh, for what I was facing when the veterans were coming back from, from Iraq and Afghanistan, primarily Iraq and that. He said, I just don't understand. He said, they are consumed with shame and guilt. Shame and guilt are not part of trauma um, as I've understood, understood it. And, and, uh, and the therapy for the two are, are, are the treatment of the, the VA and so on. It's a deep, it's a very complicated thing, but it has to do with the shattering of one's moral, of one's moral world, the, the shattering of one's compass. And that, for instance, the women, it's primarily women who suffer from um, sexual assault in the military are said to be um, victims of moral injury. And that is, um, usually those who are speaking of moral, of moral injury include them. Now, they are not guilty, but they, um, they're not perpetrators or victims, but it can shatter their trust that they live in a, world, in a good world, that they are part of. Um, it's just a, a shattering of their whole moral being, as it were. not by virtue of anything that they've done, but by virtue of something that they have been done to them. So normally moral injury is from something you do. It comes from not powerlessness in the face of loss of, of, of threat to life, but powerfulness, the wielding of power rather than the helplessness of, um, of one who is having the power and mercy of violent forces. But it does include those who, who enter a world, which I think includes my brother, who entered a world that was um, it just shed a key sense that there was a God, that there was good and evil, uh, that it, it, I think it, it just it was an you know, explosion, like a grenade had gone off in his own, in his own moral consciousness. The sense if there was any such thing as humanity. My brother was a non-combatant, he was a Japanese assistant in Vietnam, but he also was there when Cardinal Spellman came and spoke to the troops um, at Lake um, and and said that they were holy soldiers, they were Christian warriors, that um, that they were um, that this was a holy war and a holy crusade, and so and my brother, who was a very devout Catholic. I won't say what was, all that he said about, about that experience, but this was his said, this is my church. This is my the soil in which my soul was was reared. And and I think I mean he, he's no question that he, he suffered moral injuries when uh, from from that in you know, 35 years to recover from the trauma of that, you know, and to recover his faith, to recover a sense that people were more good than bad. I mean, do you think that this, um, um, that some of the, the quotes I mentioned by, by um, everyone from Darwin to Steven Pinker was, you know, the year, and the Martha Nussbaum, that our identity as human beings, our very fiber as human beings, is dependent on what we can do. I mean, the difference between good and evil in the sense that we live in a good world we can be assaulted and afflicted and tainted, but essentially the person across me from me is not a monster. They are human, and I can find the human in them. Okay? And, and the human in the humanity in myself. Is that helpful? In the yeah, yes. I think so. And this is all about the de anti dehumanization. The, the recognition and the embracing of the humanity of others, no matter what you have suffered at their 
or whatever they have done to you. Alistair Little, who is a child soldier, he's, he's one of the major voices here, the UVF officer, uh, soldier. He, he, at the age of 14, was enlisted as an assassin who killed a man. Um, there's a quite wonderful movie made about uh, Ruth Scott, the woman who died today. She wrote his story with him. Uh, it was made into a film in which Liam Neeson played Alistair. Um, and it's a story about conflict, about child soldiers, and he attempted to run from that. And he made some, have, makes, have some peace with the person, the family of the person who killed the young man. So um, it's called Five Minutes in Five Minutes of Heaven. I, I don't know if we have, do we have time for one very short question, if you maybe keep the answer? Um, oh, I see. Okay, yes. Uh, I, I just wanted to, I had, I wanted to talk about the healing process. Uh, and really, in terms of, the, when it comes to moral injury, people, it might not be their, Sometimes they're participants, other times they're witnesses, but they've been involved in it. They feel they're worthless, that nobody can love them, that God doesn't love them. In fact, they get mad at God, which is very natural, by the way. Uh, they get mad at God. And so the healing process of moral injury is, A, they have to know what they have. I can't tell you how many veterans out there when I speak about moral injury, all kinds of light bulbs, I'm sure the same thing happens to you, Bob. Uh, all kinds of light bulbs go off because they've been told they have PTSD and they don't. PTSD is normally from an external event that's happened to you. Moral injury, you internalize it yourself. And so now, now you, so you have to know what you have, you have to ask for forgiveness and re receive some kind of forgiveness whether it's from a moral authority or somebody that you respect or whatever. But then you need to rebuild that lost sense of self-worth. And the best way, one of the best ways to do that is by serving others. And veterans, people join the military because it's in their DNA to serve. And so, if, and what better institution do we have in our society that provides serving opportunities, but our houses of worship. And so I could only ask you all to think about uh, getting involved with your houses of worship, to reach out to veterans. And because serving opportunities are there, and what better volunteers can parishes and congregations have but veterans? People have been in leadership positions, they've been uh, they've been part of teams, and they're disciplined, and they get things done. So that's my plea to you all to think about that. Um, I'll be real short here. Um, I actually printed out your biography, Professor, um, earlier this morning. One thing that caught my attention is that you were a consultant to a three-person team of international peace reconciliation workers commissioned by the EU to write a manual for the healing of war trauma and moral injury through storytelling. Throughout your conversation here, and also that storytelling seemed very important. And all I would like to say is to everyone here, and I think you have a brochure, uh, the Bellarmine Retreat House in Barrington has such a day three times a year where veterans can come together with their families, adult family members, and they're able to discuss what they've gone through, say as much or as little. And one of the founding members of that is sitting right here, General Mokiyama. So there are some brochures there. I don't know if there's enough for absolutely everybody, but um, you know, we encourage people to take a look at that. So sorry to be an advertiser, but uh, I've been there a couple of times, and it's just a wonderful event. That's good. Mary Jean, you had something to add to that? Great. Thank you. Um, yeah. uh, I think it's time then to just uh, thank uh, Bob for a, a tremendous talk and for this tremendous witness and the work that you've done.